This is Kim Newlove, host of the Pharmacist Voice podcast, where I share my journey from pharmacist to voice actor and interview a variety of people who use their voices to advocate for something, educate in some way, or entertain so that you can be inspired to use your voice too. This is episode 120, and you can find the show notes with links to anything mentioned on today's show on my website, thepharmacistvoice.com. Today's episode is the third and final part of my pharmacy podcast series. Part one was an introduction to the series, including the definition of a pharmacy podcast and where to find them. Plus, part one featured a brief interview with fellow pharmacist podcaster, Dr. Christina Madison, the public health pharmacist. Then part two of the series featured a list of pharmacy podcasts I listen to and reasons that I listen to pharmacy podcasts. Now today, special guest Todd Urey, founder of the Pharmacy Podcast Network, joins me for a discussion about why pharmacists should have a podcast. We'll talk about what's in it for the pharmacist hosting the podcast and what's in it for the listener. If you're unfamiliar with Todd Urey, you're in for a treat. He's a Pittsburgh native who started the first podcast about the profession of pharmacy in 2009. Today, the Pharmacy Podcast Network is the global leader in podcasting about the business and profession of pharmacy. Todd and I have been in touch for just about as long as I've been a podcaster, which is about two years. He has been a cheerleader for me and for all of pharmacy podcasting, and that's one of the reasons that he's on the show today. As soon as Todd saw that I launched a series about pharmacy podcasts, he reached out and offered to help me with it, and I am so glad he did. His enthusiasm for pharmacy podcasts is unmatched, and there's no one I would rather have hosted today's discussion with. Thanks, Todd. Without further ado, here's my conversation with Todd Urey. Hi, Todd. Welcome to the Pharmacist Voice Podcast. How are you? I'm I'm excited, Kim. I can't believe I'm finally here and I'm a fan of yours. So having an opportunity to be on your show is an honor. So thank you so much. Well, you're welcome. Flattery will get you everywhere, sir. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> no, this is great. The founder of the Pharmacy Podcast Network on my podcast during American Pharmacist Month. How perfect is this timing? Yes. Um, it's an honor to be part of the pharmacy community. I've been in pharmacy now since 2004 and launched our uh, industry's very first podcast about our profession because there was nothing for me to listen to as I drove an hour and 10 minutes to the the, the Pittsburgh International Airport. So um, I was curious. I wanted to learn. And um, I had a lot of windshield time. So I decided I'm going to start interviewing pharmacists and pharmacy professionals and technologists. And now it's the the biggest of the of the podcasts in the in the healthcare industry with 44 different pharmacist participants and and people that are digging into specific themes. So I am I'm in Every every day I come to work, I pinch myself because I'm so excited to be advocating for um, for the pharmacist and and um, and using audio as a supplement to education. So I'm excited to talk to you about podcasting today. Oh yeah, we're gonna nerd out about podcasts. That's right. <laughs> well, the original reason that I invited you to be on the podcast is that I wanted to talk about reasons that pharmacists should have a podcast. What's in it for the pharmacist? What's in it for the listener? And just so that the audience knows, we're not always going to agree. We've both got our own opinions, and I'm not saying we're going to disagree, but hey, it's a discussion. That's right. Very good. I like that. Going back to your background just a little bit, would you mind telling me why you started the Pharmacy Podcast Network? What's your background? How'd this all get started? So first of all, I'm not a pharmacist like you are. So you bring a different perspective to podcasting and audio creation than I do. Um, I really try to elevate the voices of our podcasters. And I'm, I'm very good and effective at using social media to get people to listen, to get people to connect. 
Um, one of my favorite platforms is LinkedIn, um, and I've done very well with that over the years. My background was technology. So I was selling pharmacy management systems to privately owned organizations in the community and the long-term care space, as well as the specialty pharmacy space. And I did that for about eight years before developing my own pharmacy buying group. And what it taught me was how important data was um, to supporting pharmacists and to supporting the effectiveness of pharmacists for the treatments that they were assigned to for their for their patients and for their communities and even the most frail of our patients, which are our seniors. And that became a mission in my mind to build more social media advocacy. And I picked podcasting because once again, it was a way for me to learn. Um, I'm probably the number one listener of my own podcasts because I I constantly go back to episodes to rehash or relearn or re-listen to something that a pharmacist has talked about. And I consider myself probably the most, the, the smartest parrot of pharmacists out there because I listen to what you're saying intently. And um, I'm able to kind of weave that together together over, you know, 1400 episodes that are out there. Well, you certainly have had a lot of practice listening if you've got 1,400 episodes, and I enjoy plenty of the shows that are on your network. In fact, sometimes that's how I do what I call recon or reconnaissance or research for guests that I'm considering for my show. So thank you, Todd, for the great content that your network puts out. Absolutely. that Hearing you say that, Kim, is is pretty special because if I can... If I can help another pharmacist develop their own podcasts and then take it to another level, then I think that that means that my mission is accomplished as a, as a, as a network of podcasters. You're definitely doing good things. There's definitely good content coming out of the Pharmacy Podcast Network. Now, one of the favorite shows that I like to listen to is the Story Podcast, and that's with Dr. Christine Manukian. And I tell you something, I liked her podcast so much when it came out that I used to take screenshots of it and post it on my Instagram because number one, she told me to, but number two, I thought it was worth sharing. So I thought she's with the Pharmacy Podcast Network. This is great. She's getting a lot of different ears, you know, so to speak on her content. So thanks for what you do for some of my favorite podcasts and podcasters. That's awesome. It is, and it's it's a collective. Um, if I didn't have the network built the way that we did, and there was no podcast network for dummies when I was building it. As a matter of fact, I, I still don't think there is. But what I was good at is I was, once again, um, we had podcasters, pharmacists that were concentrating on building content, and they would tell me the numbers that they were getting downloads per month, which isn't isn't the end-all, be-all. It's not that it's the most important thing. But the numbers that were being shared were a fraction of what we were getting per episode in of the 82,000 listeners that are coming to the network to listen over a period of 30 days. And we're putting out about six podcasts per week uh, times four, so 24 episodes on average. And what that does is that collective gets the attention of organizations that are outside of our um, you know industry. Um, you know, our podcasts are really the B2B environment, the the business to business, the professional to professional. But podcasting in the hands of a pharmacist that is concentrating on, let's say, a specific disease state, let's say diabetes, this is a powerful, powerful medium to reach patients that, guess what, don't have to doctor Google something and try to find a solution to what um, what they're experiencing as someone that's suffering with diabetes. They could listen to the words of a doctor of pharmacy, and they could build a relationship with that pharmacist by coming back, you know, week after week or month after month or whatever frequency that you're on to listen to someone who actually knows what they're talking about. So the, today's episodes is special to me because I think there's two sides of this. There's continuing my journey, which is supporting the profession of pharmacy in the B2B space and building podcasts for organizations that want to reach pharmacists. That's my comfort zone. But then there's the other side, which is the consumer facing, the client facing, the patient facing. That's where the mission becomes a lot more meaningful. And it gives me chills to think if I could help a pharmacist reach their community through audio and 
and help them build the podcast the right way and market it the right way to reach a maximum people to listening, that could become a way to market them as an expert, but it would also be used as great information getting to the public so that we can demystify some of the bad information that's out there or the conspiracy theories that are out there because you'd get to listen to a PharmD, a pharmacist, talk about a specific condition. So I think there's a future for that. You made a great comment just now about how a PharmD or a pharmacist can talk to someone. And one of the reasons that I think a pharmacist should have a podcast is not just that B2B thing, it's the pharmacist to patient connection. Let's say an independent pharmacy in a, any size town across the U.S. had a podcast and just made it their goal to have 10 of them. You can talk about anything you want, how to get a refill, the best time to get a refill, common problems patients in this area have, flu shot schedules, store schedules, holiday schedules, meet the pharmacist, meet the techs, you know, anything. The history of this business, um, problems that our customers typically have that they come into us for, anything. I think that's one reason that a pharmacist could have a podcast. What are your thoughts on that? Absolutely. The evolution of what we've designed started out with um, very specific verticals, uh, long-term care pharmacy, for example. But today we have specialty and compounding and health system conversations, inspirational uh, podcasts about resiliency or burnout. We've set the stage in 2022 to come to the marketplace, to come to exactly what you were saying, Kim, about community pharmacist support and coming up with a package that could be turnkey for that community pharmacist to be able to speak directly to their specific community and with the intimacy of what that pharmacy owner understands about their community that no one else understands. So you couldn't have necessarily a national podcast, which by the way, there are uh, pharmacists that are doing that, and that's great. But imagine a community pharmacist talking about Butler, Pennsylvania, and talking about their high school winning a football game, or um, a new doctor that's come aboard in the community, or, hey, uh, flu season's coming up, make sure you get your flu shot and head on down to, you know, ABC Community Pharmacy to do it. It would be, uh, it would be almost like a custom radio show just for that community that the pharmacist could really take control of to make it, once again, much more personalized. So I think you are absolutely on to something, and it's the same direction that the Pharmacy Podcast Network is going for 2022. Yeah. Uh, you know, you, any podcast that's out there, it kind of automatically gets to be international as long as it doesn't have explicit content, because I know there's quite a few countries who restrict the listener experience for their individual countries based on explicit versus clean rating. So as soon as I got on the airwaves, I was an international podcast. <laughs> it's true. But people learn from each other. And another reason to get yourself out there, you always got to think about your audience when you're a podcaster. Say there's an independent pharmacy that has a podcast, kind of like you explained just now, and they're advertising not only their services, flu shots, for example, prescription drugs, OTCs, but they mention how they're supporting their community or, you know, it becomes a little bit, a little piece of that part of America that gets put out there. And then other people can listen to that. Other pharmacists can listen to that and decide, I want to do that too. Or I might like to do something a little different. And we become students of podcasting. And that is what I am actually talking about on Friday, October 22nd. Today, as we record this, it's Wednesday, October 20th. So it's a little, it's going to be in the past, I guess, by the time this comes out on October 29th. But I mean, it, there's all kinds of things that you can do with podcasting. And if you, as a pharmacist, listen to all kinds of podcasts, you'll pick the pieces and parts that you want to include in yours, and you can move forward with that and just draw strength from all these other pharmacist podcasters. And like Todd said just a little bit ago, he's on LinkedIn. He loves LinkedIn. I'm on LinkedIn. I love LinkedIn. And if you love LinkedIn too, connect with both of us and maybe there's something that we can all learn from each other. Absolutely. I learn something almost every day through LinkedIn of what's being posted from 
a variance of something that might be insignificant versus something that came out from a major announcement from the FDA. And having a pharmacist uh, give me their opinion, that means something to me. I look to pharmacists are my favorite providers as the as the barometer, as the as the compass of of good health, and I always measure that with um, with studies as well. So, you know, I challenge any pharmacist that wants to get into podcasting, and let's talk about this and jump into this. There's the editorial side of podcasting, and then there's the fact or peer reviewed side of podcasting, and I think that pharmacists need to blend that. I think that their opinion is very important. But I also think if they're a PharmD and they're speaking on something, they should reference material that they know and they trust as peer-reviewed, as journal articles, as things that have been proven, so that someone that catches the podcast, even though you and I might, might mark it to the professional side of, of our worlds, per se, if someone picks up this podcast and they hear something and we were starting to dig down into a disease state, we'd want to make sure that what we were talking about was referenceable and that could be an access and or a conduit to more information that would be evidence-based and that would be factual. What you're talking about there is something that I, I don't want to call it CYA, but any pharmacist that starts talking about clinical stuff should really have some sort of a disclaimer at the beginning. Like, this is my opinion. This doesn't reflect the opinion of my employer. Do your due diligence. Make sure that you're under the supervision of a doctor, things like that. Because people like to find shortcuts. And I'm not trying to judge at all, but sometimes a patient will hear something and they don't know to do their due diligence and research something and get the data and really weigh it against, you know, the pros and the cons. Okay, this says to do this thing. What does the opposition say? Some people don't know how to do that. So, uh, I know you bring up kind of a good point. Having pharmacists who are excellent medical professionals talk about disease states is great. It's great for the patient, but I think definitely we need to almost tell people using a disclaimer that this is for information only. This isn't the only information you should be making your decision on. What do you think about that? Excellent point. I think that yeah. if you're marketing yourself as an as a pharmacist and as an expert around any of the conditions, you need to have a disclaimer for your own protection. And just in case mm -hmm. came back and said uh, you know, Dr. Smith, uh, you know, told me this on a podcast. Well, you need that disclaimer to protect you in publishing. And podcasting is becoming much more serious than it ever was. You know, in 2009, there were less than 200,000 podcasts listed in Apple. Uh, it was called iTunes at the time, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> and now there's 2.3 million podcasts out there. Now, there's uh, less than 30% uh, of the 2.3 that are sustained and, and built and continued, but that number is quickly changing where there's a lot more work that go into podcasting than a lot of people think, especially if you want a high quality show, just as yours is, Kim. And you put a tremendous amount of time and effort into your podcast because of um, what your belief is in, in your professionalism. And and that's what we do. We, we expect uh, high quality audio, high quality discussions, uh, referenceable materials. So if you're going to podcast, um, like Yoda says, either do or do not, there is no try. <laughs> you have to <laughs> jump into it understanding that um, you might build something for a short amount of time. Maybe it's a series. Maybe it's a three-part series or a six-part series or a 12-part series. But remember, if you're a pharmacist and you're podcasting, there's almost like a higher expectation of the content that comes from you versus even me. Even though I hold myself to a higher standard, I'm not a PharmD. So if I wanted to talk about hyperlipidemia, I would um, you know, reference material or bring up an article or talk about a journal, but I don't have any authority to give anyone advice, medical advice on that. Whereas a pharmacist literally could, and they need to be very careful in how they stage uh, their audio ensuring that uh, the people that are listening understand that they should be reaching out to their physician, they should be asking questions of their own pharmacist, and making sure that uh, what's being talked about is, is right for them and right for their own specific uh, situation. Yes, good points. Well made. 
Totally agree. Now, as far as what's in it for the pharmacist, what do you see as the benefits of podcasting for pharmacists? So podcasting allows you to build a very strong relationship with your audience very fast. Um, If you can listen to my voice inflection as you and I talk, Kim, you can pick up that I'm very sincere. The reason is, is because I love what I do. So if you're a pharmacist and you're going to build a podcast, make sure that you take the time to review the material that you're going to be talking about, whether that's to an audience that is geared towards like patients or community or If it's to a professional, if if you're talking to, um, you're intending your podcast to go to other professionals, that's fine. But when you think about it, realize that your voice inflection, uh, voice is so important, your cadence, your speech pattern, the clarity of your voice, the words that you're using, just make sure and keep in in touch with, with yourself as you move forward in podcasting that it means a lot to your audience. And there's intimacy that you can build with your audience through podcasting that you really can't do in your writing per se. Writing comes across differently than audio does, as does Mm -hmm. video. I mean, video can be used and you can even do video like on Zoom, for example, and strip the audio and use it just as a podcast. However, I think that podcasting, because of its popularity, is becoming much more popular and it's 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 being taken much more seriously. So it's going to give pharmacists a very unique opportunity to present themselves as professionals, whether that is emotionally supportive, clinically supportive, um, an author, an, an, an authentic, um, you know, source of information. It's a huge opportunity, and I've read many different articles, including a Forbes article that has stated that podcasting is still considered in its infancy. So there's a lot of work that can be done and there's lots of um, pharmacists out there that could take advantage of the medium and push it out and, and use it as a amplifier of, of their beliefs and as an amplifier of their, uh, them as themselves and start audio branding. Oh, is that all? <laughs> <laughs> That's just the tip of the iceberg. I think there's a lot that pharmacists can get out of podcasting. So what's in it for the pharmacist? You mentioned, the last thing you mentioned was branding. I mean, that really establishes somebody's brand. You've got the public health pharmacist, you've got just all kinds. I'm not going to name them all, but that just establishes them as the person in that category to listen to. It's not like we won't listen to anybody else, but we're probably going to be comparing. So be the first in that category. That's my suggestion. Absolutely. And then realize that you bring a unique um, overview. I could listen to 10 podcasts in a row, and I always get something out of each of them that's that's obviously different than the next to the next. The personality of the person, um, their, their excitement in their voice, the sincerity in their voice, Um, you know, and it doesn't always have to be perfect. Um, Podcasting can be messy. It doesn't have to be, you know, I've been handed when I had a, I had a client come to me, which was a pharma manufacturer and they wanted me to build six episodes and they handed me or they emailed me um, a, a, a word doc. that was all verbatim scripted. And it was based on a little bit of their paranoia as a pharma company because they wanted to know what they're publishing is, is right. And I was like, listen, we can follow an outline, but if you read this verbatim, it's going to sound very insincere and it's going to sound um, scripted. Unless you have somebody like Mike Lentz, who's a masterful <laughs> podcast and voice reader, um, I think he could get away with reading something and making it sound sincere. But I think the average you know, person that isn't used to audio creation, that if you handed them something and said, now read this, it's going to sound like you're reading something and it's not going to sound sincere. So you have to, Mm -hmm. I I asked them to give me an outline and we ended up working through an outline instead of a, instead of a script. You just mentioned one of the struggles that I had early on. I didn't know what to say. And anybody who's new to podcasting might think, well, gosh, you put me in a room by myself with a microphone. What am I going to say? And I, I can tell you, I still to this day struggle with it. I will make myself lists of handwritten notes. <laughs> I will type out outlines. I'll give myself a sentence to launch off of. But I still, I feel like 
just kind of stiff. I would so much rather be doing this today's episode as an interview. I was going to do this as a solo show, but Todd reached out to me and he just said the right thing. And I said, Todd, why don't you come on the show so I don't have to do this all by myself? I love that. <laughs> and, I love that. and I did not have to twist his arm very hard at all. <laughs> no, no. If, if I get to talk with a pharmacist and it's a podcast, I'm, I'm probably going to be there nine out of 10 times. I'll definitely be. <laughs> oh, this is great. Timing's great and everything. Uh, but there are so many other reasons for pharmacists to start a podcast. You brought up the branding. We talked a little bit about branding, but also, I mean, who doesn't love a personal challenge? I mean, some people think, oh, everybody else has a podcast. Can I do it? And, you know, some people start it and then they pod fade and I'm not judging, but you get bragging rights. You did it. You know what I'm saying? True. And you get to find out that personal challenge may not be worth carrying on because then you realize how much time it takes. I have to make a comment about Dr. Isabel Litvick, who is the new host of Beyond the SIG, which is Pennsylvania Pharmacists Association's podcast that um, is part of our network. And I threw her to the lions um, at a national trade show where I wasn't able to make the trade show. And I asked her, would you be the podcaster and cover the uh, PPA's annual event and collect all the interviews. And she was so nervous and she's like, well, what do I say? And what's the outline? And I'm like, just, you know, I'm going to give you a light outline, but you just go with it. She did a tremendous job. And she told me afterwards, um, she called me about a week later and said, this helps me become a better communicator. I had to think of my feet. I had to speak to, um, you know, people that I had high respect for and I was recording it. So it made it like an extra level of, of pressure, but she pulled it off. And I was like, by the way, audio is magic because you can edit anything. So mm -hmm. you don't have to be perfect. <laughs> um, and, and you and I are both editing people. So we, we like to edit and make things sound as, as good as possible. But think about this pharmacist that you're listening or pharmacy technicians that are listening. Mm -hmm. opportunity in podcasting for you to refine and to chip away at non-communication starters, things that are holding you back at, in your profession. Are you feeling like you can't do something? You, you jump into the deep end of the pool and you just start swimming. You start treading the water. You start, and you're going to become amazing. It just, it, time after time after time, I, sh I shared with you, Kim, before we started recording that my first 300 episodes, which were not part of a network, it was part of just me talking to people, in my opinion, were absolutely horrible. And it was because I didn't have the right technology. I didn't have the right, you know, network or, or, or um, I didn't have the right microphone. I didn't have the right ambience of the room that I was in. You know, in my opinion, they didn't sound very good. And I didn't give up. I kept pushing. I kept refining. I kept learning. I kept reading. I kept listening to other podcasters and, and kind of giving me tips. And you'll become better communicators through your podcast. And what's that going to do? Well, if you're patient facing, it's going to make you a better communicator in front of your patients. If you're an MSL, a medical science liaison, it's going to make you better in front of doctors or, or as a presenter. So podcasting has helped me break out of the shell that I was kind of in where I never wanted to speak on something that I didn't have background information on. But today I'm able to jump on into almost anything as long as I have somewhat of a reference and I do like to be prepared, but it's made me feel extremely confident. And I think anyone that gets into podcasting, that's a pharmacist or pharmacist tech or pharmacy professional, podcasting will help you feel much more confident and will help you think, think on your feet. What you just said about thinking on your feet reminds me so much of improv class, which I've been to. Oh my gosh, it's so much fun. Now, podcasting, to this day, I struggle with the solo shows, but I have fun with the interview shows. Improv class has made me think on my feet, especially with interviews, because you don't want to disregard the answer that the person you're interviewing just gave you. You want to take a little piece of it, use it, and then make a segue. All of that thinking on your feet, all of that experience, all of that falling on your face and not doing it so good for the first 300 times will make the 301st time a lot better. That's so true. 
That's so true. Um, I interviewed a major um, executive uh, from McKesson's technology division, and it was like 300 and something episode. And it was so much better than the first, uh, you know, 10 episodes or 20 episodes or 300 episodes. And you just become better and better at what you're doing. And everyone that is in our profession, 100% of you, you're, you're listening right now, you will get so much out of exercising your voice, exercising your thoughts, being able to take something that is very complex and make it understandable for the audience that you're directing it towards. Even when you're talking among other healthcare professionals, um, it gives you an opportunity to refine your communication skills. Definitely. Yes, excellent point. Todd, let's talk about other reasons pharmacists should start a podcast. I'll give you a couple, then I'd like you to think of a couple too, because I'm trying to encourage pharmacists to just jump in the pool. You know, start a podcast if that's what you want to do. And there's so many great reasons why. We talked about branding. I would say advertising and promotion definitely go along with that. It can be cathartic. I think we just talked a little bit about that. You know, you get better at it. You gain some skills, get some stuff out there. Thought leadership is another one. You can build a tribe. I have a business with a podcast. So this is branding for my business. This is networking. Uh, There's so many different reasons. Todd, let's hear a few reasons that you think pharmacists should have a podcast. So depending on what your goal is, and I would encourage anyone that wants to start a podcast um, to have a goal in mind, that goal does not have to stand off by itself. As a matter of fact, I have a strong opinion that podcasting should not stand off by itself. I believe that podcasting should supplement and should enhance and should amplify a primary source of information. I don't think it should be the only source of information, but once again, that's just my my opinion about what we do within our network and for our clients. So clients like SureScripts and Cardinal Health and um, IBM Watson, we coach them to always use podcasts as, as an amplifier. So if I were talking to a fellow pharmacist that wanted to start a podcast, I would say, number one, what's your goal? What do you want to do? And they may say, well, I want a podcast on resilience or I want a podcast on advocating for um, you know, minorities in healthcare, or I want to concentrate on a specific disease state, or I want to talk about my new coaching service. What, regardless of what it is, as long as you have the goal and understand that podcasting can supplement and t- can build your mission and, and then align it with your mission with, as your primary source of information. So it might be your blog, It might be a webinar that you just finished. It might be a book that you just wrote or you're writing. I think it's an amazing way to build credibility in what you're centered on and what your goal is. And it helps to build an audience to get to learn to know you because we're in a realm right now, obviously with the pandemic and it kind of goes up and down in severity. And I think we're coming down and, and pharmacists have, been in the front lines helping to combat that with uh, our vaccine rollout. But you think of not being able to see everybody as often as you'd like. We're not, we don't get to go as to as many conferences as I used to. So if someone mm-hmm. heard my voice over and over again, which I have so many people that will see me or, or walk up to me at a conference that will say, I just heard you talking and I recognize your voice because of your, you know, your podcast, which means a lot to me. But that's very true for you as a pharmacist or you as a technician, build your podcast knowing that it's a supplement to the greater goal in mind of what you're trying to accomplish. And then basically use it either intermittently if you want, or um, like me, um, commit to to doing it often in order to build um, that followership and that lister base. You brought up a lot of good points. Just a one-off from what you were saying as an amplifier, I think Thought leadership is really important, and I think that really speaks to what you were just saying. If you have a thought, an idea, a belief, and you want to get it out there, podcasting will amplify it. One of the hard things is that you have to have the thought in the first place before you build your tribe that follows you and maybe even have a Facebook group that goes with the podcast to you know get your tribe organized. So 
One of the things that I struggled with when I first started my business, before I even knew about podcasting, was that I had this idea to do something that you kind of were starting to do when you first started your podcast. You were talking about bringing education in audio format, weren't you, Todd? Yes, and that's still going to become a, a, a bigger part of our network. And we're, we've reached out to several pharmacists, several pharmacy schools, and most important for that education are pharmacy students, starting with the P2, the P3, and P4, to use um, podcasting as a way to build off what you've learned in that week or that semester. Build your own audio um, version of that, almost like a, an audio cliff notes of what you've just learned, and then share that with your cohorts. And how many P2s would love to hear from a fellow P2? maybe states away that would be talking about pharmacology 101 or um, oncology 101 or something that you can hear a, a review in their own words with their own voice inflection with me even sprinkling in some of their own opinion about that course material. So that's what we launched when, we've, when we put out audiorx.study was a collection of pharmacy students sharing um, information in audio form to supplement their studies so that when they're walking or they're jogging or they're driving, they can just get an audio version of what they just learned um, maybe a week ago um, from their professors or their preceptors or a fellow pharmacist or a guest speaker. But now they hear a fellow um, pharmacy student give their um, rendition or whatever the word is, um, the, 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 the cliff notes of that, of that information. That's not a bad idea as long as they took accurate and complete notes. <laughs> that would be my only caution. You wouldn't want to broadcast something that's incorrect. And I don't mean to play on the insecurities of anybody out there who may have them or be a perfectionist type. But I would just say that's a great idea. Boy, I would love to, especially if I had to work a late shift at the hospital and I chose sleep over class, I would love to have somebody uh, tell me what was learned about in class because, yeah, I'm going to talk to the teacher about it, the professor, but I'd also like to have the student version too. So I, I, I applaud you. I think that's a great idea when and if used in the right way. Yep. And like I said, I think it's a supplement. I don't think it's the primary source of information. So it's a great way to hear someone else's like version of that information, but then you should always go back to the primary source. Yes. Good disclaimer, Todd. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I brought up the whole, you know, learning aspect of podcasting because when I first started marketing pharmacy continuing education in audio format as part of my business, I couldn't find anybody to buy, which is fine. I've definitely pivoted and gone in different directions, but people kept telling me, you know, we don't want to buy this, but if you have your own original content, by all means, you should be putting that out there. So I want to bring up about the idea to pharmacist podcasters or potential pharmacist podcasters that if you have an idea in you, podcasting is not a bad way to go. For example, I, over the course of my business doings, got obsessed with how to pronounce drug names. There are so many people who would find out, oh, you're a pharmacist. How do you pronounce this? And I say that with a lot of love, even if it doesn't sound that way, <laughs> but it, it's like a broken record. It's kind of like a running joke, but I don't take it as a joke. Okay. I take it seriously. And they ask, you know, how do you pronounce something as simple as metronidazole? And the question kept coming up and kept coming up. So I made a drug name pronunciation course and I worked with the United States Adopted Names Council and the FDA to uncover basically the naming strategies. And what I realized is that there's a dictionary out there. So for anybody out there that doesn't know how to pronounce generic names, it's all in the USP dictionary online. And the FDA taught me their standard operating procedure for pronouncing brand name drugs. And then I started getting in touch with branding companies. And I think my retirement job is going to be naming drugs because I geek out about it so much. I love it. That's so but cool. that was an original thought. Like who comes up with a drug name pronunciation course? I, I have seen one other out there on the internet. But again, this is thought leadership. 
I can build a tribe of people that want to learn this skill, form a Facebook group. I have my online course. That is something pharmacists can do with podcasts. Absolutely. Absolutely. And they can help other pharmacists and pharmacy students with that. I remember Tony Guerra doing something like that, where he had a multitude of um, books that he put out, as well as audio yes. that he put out on on drug names. And therein lies my non-pharmacist uh, badge, because I am horrible <laughs> at, at, I only say a couple little names here and there, Kim, because they're the ones I've practiced. I can oh, say- Oh, come on, Todd. Medics, I can say hyperlipidemia, <laughs> and it all runs off. But if I start looking at like that drug that came out that sounded like nebulinab or something or. Oh, bamlanivimab. That's yeah, I worked with Eli Lilly's, oh, what was it? Their drug information department to put out a public service announcement on LinkedIn for how to pronounce that. So if you look back in my history long enough, you can find that. Yep. Yes, that's the one. Say it again. That was pro bono work right there, but it was worth it. <laughs> again, say it one more time. Oh, bamlanivimab. It just rolls. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, I found out strategies for how to break the words down. And I mean, that's worth the price of the course. So go to kimnewlove.com and buy Pronounce Drug Names Like a Pro online course today. That's awesome. <laughs> See, it's brought to you by Kim New Love. Yes. I'm, I'm, yeah, that's right. I'm sponsoring my own podcast, which is something other pharmacists can do too. Really, I think Dr. Adam Martin does that for the Fit Pharmacist Healthcare Podcast too. He has an online course about branding, and his branding course sponsors his podcast, if I'm not mistaken. So you'll see, or so you'll hear advertisements for the branding course in the podcast, and that's a great way to go. There's there's no rules in podcasting. I mean, there's some, but there's no rules in podcasting. <laughs> Why not? All of our clients that are part of our network now um, are using podcasting as an amplifier to something else that they're doing and it's brought to you by them so it's and brought to you by their service or brought to you by their product so it's it's a great way to um, to supplement information and it builds trust with an audience because they get to hear the voice inflection and they get to hear your information and your intelligence and I just I think if you're honest and you're relaxed and you get yourself a nice microphone, let's talk about mics real quick. So you and I both started with the Blue Yeti and I've kept mine because it's my like, you know, it's it's kind of like a prize that I, I haven't used it in over eight years now, but it was my yes. first. So what do you, what's your favorite microphone? Oh, I have so many. I probably have like 10 microphones around here. <laughs> I'm a big nerd. Okay. I... Um, I use a cheap one for podcasting. Right now, I am using an Audio-Technica 2100 USB microphone plugged directly into an iMac. I could use one of my two audio interfaces, which is somewhere around here, but I just plug it right into the iMac because it's just easy and it's set it and forget it type of thing. I use it for Zoom meetings. I use it for, you know, if anybody interviews me on a podcast for my podcast interviews, but if you want to hear about my other nine uh, mics, let me know. <laughs> yes. So I I now understand and never understood why women, especially women, maybe men too, but more women will buy a lot of shoes. And my wife is one of the people. <laughs> and, and, I, and I would make fun of my wife about her shoes. But now I don't because I have a, I have a, an addiction to microphones. You know, I have, you have a mic locker is what you do. I have 15 <laughs> microphones. I only need oh. maybe three of them. And uh -huh. I love microphones. And I, my favorite one cool. is what I'm talking in right now. This is the Shure MV7 and it's plugged into the Rodecaster um, mixer board, which is so simple. And it's a, I highly, uh, uh, you know, it's a, it's, it's mid price. It's six hundred dollars, and it's an amazing board. I had when I first started this studio, um, we had a twelve channel, or was it fourteen? Might have been fourteen channel big mixer board that was actually for music creation, and it was way overkill, and it was super expensive. It was like fourteen hundred dollars, and and then when Roadcaster came out with this simple board, it's made my life so much simpler, and I can even like press this button. And like clap for ourselves. And you have the Roadcaster Pro, is that right? Yes, I love yes. it. 
I love yeah, it. and you can literally, if somebody were in there in person, you could plug in what five other mics, total of six inputs. That's true. And you could mix a big old podcast, you know. But you and I were on Squadcast today. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but um, I I love podcasting. If if anyone is listening to us, please reach out to uh, Dr. Kim Newlove or myself or any of our podcasters on our network. Uh, they're so helpful. Every single one of them would be willing to give you advice on on podcasting from being more technical like Kim and I are and we're nerding out like we like you said, Kim, or, <laughs> or just, you know, how to get started and in, in being comfortable and in, in talking and and really just being yourself. But regardless, if you are thinking about it and you're on the edge, um, jump in. Uh, the the pool the water is is a great temperature for podcasting right now and and I would gladly help you and I know that you would help as well Kim. Yeah, you bet. I, people contact me all the time. I'm not going to name names, so anybody that's getting nervous, your name's not about to be broadcast. <laughs> but what's really cool about me and my podcast is that I talk about how the sausage is made. I talk about podcasting stuff. Some people just use their podcast to get their message out about whatever their thought leadership is or their brand or their business. So if somebody contacts me about microphones, I think I actually have an episode about that from last November. It's really short. And the show notes are gold. I don't know about you, but I make sure that whatever I'm talking about on the podcast gets into the show notes, at least like the biggest items. So for example, you, Todd Yuri, your LinkedIn profile is going to make it into my show notes. The Pharmacy Podcast Network is going to be in the show notes. If I give somebody a link to that podcast, not only can they listen to it for eight minutes or whatever it is, because mine are short, I'm very short-winded, then they can also look in the show notes, literally click the link buy the exact microphone I was just talking about and go. It's like super simple. Um, I'm not saying that I have an advantage over other pharmacy podcasters, but I just talk about how the sausage is made more than other people. I also have an episode about the top 10 suggestions for guests on podcasts. So, you know, microphone, having a good one, having good headphones, having good connectivity, things like that. I talk about all those tips. So I'm not saying I'm better than anybody else at all, but I mean, I can literally say, listen to episode so-and-so and and you're going to be able to hear it just like it just came out of my mouth and read the show notes and click the links and go right there. So that's kind of cool. Thank you for offering yourself, Todd, as a resource. Having resources is important for anybody, especially when they're doing something for the first time because they don't know what they don't know until they know. And then it, it just seems hard. So shortcuts are awesome, right? (laughs) Yes. Yes. I think you have very unique, a very unique show because I don't do how to make the sausage in podcasting. I've jumped right into what clients need and we jump right into, you know, specific uh, avenues of, of information. Then we dig in as, as deep as we can within a specific episode or multi series. Um, Whereas your podcast, Kim is, probably one of the only ones in the pharmacy industry that does give that kind of um, coaching. And I think that's really important. Thank you very much, Todd. I think it's neither good nor bad. What it is, is the focus of my show, instead of being solely an interview show or solely like a how-to show or an advice show, mine's a journey style podcast. I'm going to say this for anybody listening who's thought about starting a podcast but is hesitant you don't have to know everything. You can do a journey style podcast, right? And you can tell people as you're doing it, like, holy crap, I just quit my job Friday. And now let's see what happens next. And then every week people will join you because they want to see what happens next. And on my journey from pharmacist to voice actor, learning about microphones is something that I've learned about, you know, Learning about what guests need to know for podcasting is definitely something that I've learned as I've gone on my journey from pharmacist to voice actor, and it can help other people. So why wouldn't I share it? And, you know, just content ideas for anybody out there, journey style, and just show them what's happening to you as it's happening. That's okay, too. Absolutely. We try to do so many things different. I don't don't want to listen to a podcast that's just interviews. 
I don't want to listen to just solo. I don't want to listen to a panel. I like mixing it up. And that's why I, I really like listening. And you've presented that in your styling. I know that you've done a, a multitude of different um, styles of podcast. And that that in and of itself should give all of our listeners that are considering podcast, it should give you encouragement that it's your own style. You, you don't have to follow any specific format as long as you uh, have a goal in mind of what you're doing it for and how it can help accentuate and support that goal that you've put out there that isn't necessarily just podcast based. It's there's usually a bigger picture um, in in why you're podcasting, but I I think it's absolutely just incredible to get into it and and don't overthink it and just jump in and begin um, learning. And the more mistakes that you make, the faster that you'll learn. And um, you know, look at me. I made three hundred episodes before I felt like I knew what I was doing. So. Don't don't go that far, by the way. <laughs> you brought up a great point, though. I mean, it takes a certain number of podcasts before you yourself quit judging yourself. I think it took at least 100 episodes before I quit judging myself harshly. But I still think that my solo shows are not as good as my interview shows because I personally struggle with coming up with what to say without having to look at a script, you know, like recording an audiobook is one thing, but then sitting in front of a microphone in a room, nobody else around and just a machine, you know, the fans whirring from the laptop because it's working hard to record me. I, I got to think about what to say without sounding like self aggrandizing or clueless. You know, you got to find that middle road. And it's okay to not be good when you start is what I'm saying, because that's what you need to hear. You as a beginner podcaster or somebody who's a podcaster to be needs to hear that we are hard on ourselves and we know we're not perfect when we start, but we start anyways, because we want to get our message out there. Absolutely. Don't put so much pressure on yourself and get into it and, and, you know, start jogging and walking in the podcast world and read and and listen to other podcasts. Uh, that's how I've learned more than anything is listening to other podcasters. Nice comment. Yes, I totally agree. That is why I listen to pharmacy podcasts. I learn from them, you know. I learn what kind of an intro people prefer to put out there. Do I like what they're doing? Do I want to do that too? I have changed so much from listening to not just pharmacy podcasts, but other podcasts too. And I love your comment about don't be so hard on yourself because there are some people out there that are just perfectionists and there's room for you too, but just give yourself some grace because you're going to screw up. You're going to look back at episode number one. You're going to listen to episode one and you're going to say, wow, I've come far, you know, and you're going to want to take it off the air. But I'm telling you, just leave it there to remind yourself that you were scared and you did it anyway. It makes me think of Dr. Christina Madison, who's one of your friends and my friends. And you just met her at Medipreneurs recently in Cincinnati. Mm -hmm. I saw pictures of you, which I love those pictures, but she is an amazing podcaster because she just doesn't care about perfection. She just gets in there and she does it. And I think of her almost like a boxer podcaster. She just gets in and she slugs, 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 and she puts out amazing content. And it's because she has refined herself and done it over and over and over again. And obviously she's a public speaker too, and she's tied into uh, Las Vegas, I think at the N NBC affiliate, but she, she has so much practice with speaking uh, publicly as the public health pharmacist, which is so cool. That's a great name, but she's yes. a perfect example. Of, she didn't perfect things and she she has notes and she has uh, you know primary information that she's pulling from, but she will will be the first one to tell you that it's not about perfection. Yeah, she is definitely gifted at speaking, and that is, that is a bonus. Not everybody feels comfortable in front of a mic, but I'll tell you, we had this portable lavalier microphone set up, and we're in a hotel bar, not drinking, of course, <laughs> and we put on these lavalier microphones, and she's like, yeah, I'll be on your podcast, and she, we were just testing out equipment, but yeah, she's just fearless, and I love her. She and I had met in person only there at Cincinnati at the Metapreneurs Conference, but we have seen each other on Zoom, you know, had meeting 
a meeting single, I think. And we've definitely had plenty of exchanges on social media. But yes, you bring up Dr. Christina Madison, and she's a good role model. You know, she would never tell anybody to do something that she would not herself do. Much respect. Absolutely. Shout out. Well, I'd like to make sure that we talk about what's in it for the listener. For all of these pharmacy podcasts, we talked a little bit earlier about hearing what pharmacies have to offer or local information if an independent pharmacy would make a pharmacy podcast. But Todd, what do you think else is in it for the listener? So I think the listener, depending on who your audience is, is going to extract different things from different podcasts. And therefore, you and I, um, we direct most of our podcasts um, to the professional, to our fellow pharmacy professionals. Um, and therein lies a commitment that we've made to you know, have a quality show that we know that other professionals are listening to. However, if you think about and it actually, to me, in my opinion, almost seems like it would be harder for a pharmacist to create content for the consumer. And that is, you have to obviously, like we just got done saying, we have to be careful what you're saying and the, the fact that you want to have um, clarification that you should be talking with your physician or whatever. But to be able to create something that's fun to listen to, and you have to keep them in mind, your audience is your listener. So you want your voice to be fun to listen to. You certainly don't want to be robotic. Um, you don't want to sound like you're reading something. And you want to give them value in what you're saying, or at least that episode overall, so that you can give them something extra. So you could say at the end, hey, listen, um, audience, um, if you go to the show notes, there's going to be a link. And if you if you put in your name and email and phone number or name and email, um, you're going to be part of a raffle that we're going to do in two weeks for a $50 gift card for Amazon or something, whatever, whatever it is that you're providing extra cherry on top benefit to your listener. And I think listeners appreciate extra stuff like that because then it gets them coming back to your podcast. And, and for them, it, I think they feel that it's valuable because you're fun. To, if you can be fun to listen to and you can do little extra things, I think that that's always uh, in good favor for the listener. I agree with all that. I have not done any raffles. I think that would be fun. Have you done any raffles? I'm curious. I did a raffle a couple years ago. I haven't done. We've done book giveaways a couple times um, for people that we've interviewed, um, but um, not not as often as I should. I just I get so busy in serving my clients that I don't have time to be as creative as I'd like. All right. Well, I have thought about raffling off my first ever microphone my blue Yeti, but I haven't done it yet. I've I thought about it. I couldn't give away my Yeti, Kim. <laughs> my first mic. Oh, shoot. <laughs> I'm just saying I've thought about it. Maybe there's somebody out there that would like that. They're good mics. So, I mean, the, the Yeti is like the workhorse of, of podcasting mics. A lot of people seem to like it and I'm not disrespecting it at all. It got me started, but it just wasn't the right choice for me as I continued, you know? And as you get to know microphones and what you need them to do for you, you you just learn what you like and what you don't and what, what you sound good on. And you sound great on yours. Thank you. Yeah, it's a, we put a lot into it. I know that if, if I'm going to show up on the mic every once in a while for the pharmacy profession, uh, we better sound good. <laughs> That's right. You gotta look professional and sound professional, right? <laughs> Amen. Well, other things that I think are in it for the listener, definitely the content. You brought up the value. Hundred percent agree. Podcasts are not for us, the podcaster. They're for the listener. Exactly. And it also creates a connection. You have an opportunity to connect with your audience by what you say, and you can open up a channel for them to get in touch with you via LinkedIn, like we already talked about, or my website has a contact form. If you have a podcast, my opinion, you should also have a website for that podcast. I would like to have people connect with me if they have suggestions for guests or just to comment on things, because I'd like to know how I'm doing. Yeah. How about you? Yes, we don't do enough surveys, but we do have a survey going out soon to collect feedback from our listeners to understand 
not only what sector of pharmacy that they're in, but what content we're missing. Um, because of a survey that we did, we found out that there was a pediatric pharmacist need, and that's when we um, welcomed uh, Dr. Allison Chung, who's now known as the Pediatric Pharmacist Review, and she's the host of that podcast. So that was all from a survey. So every once in a while, if you're growing your listener base and you want to um, understand your listeners' feedback, uh, like Kim just said, have some type of contact information form or a survey or something so that you can get feedback from your listeners. Yeah, keep those channels open. You never know what you're going to find out. Absolutely. Todd, thank you so much for being on the Pharmacist Voice podcast today to talk about reasons that pharmacists should have a podcast and what's in it for the pharmacist and what's in it for the listener. This has been a great discussion and you saved me from having to do this as a solo podcast. So (laughs) you did me a favor. Thank you, Todd. You're very welcome. This is an honor to be on your show. I've listened to your show for a while now and to be um, a guest on the Pharmacist Voice, that means a lot to me. Oh, you're very welcome. I respect you as the founder of the Pharmacy Podcast Network, and you can find Todd's shows at pharmacypodcast.com. Thanks again for being with me today, Todd. Take care. Thank you. Thank you for listening to episode 120 of the Pharmacist Voice podcast. Please visit thepharmacistvoice.com to read the show notes. The show notes for this episode are a little longer than usual. (laughs) There's a lot of great stuff in there. There are links to Todd Yuri and the Pharmacy Podcast Network, reasons for starting a podcast, and more in those show notes. If you liked this episode, please share it with a friend and subscribe to or follow the Pharmacist Voice podcast so that you get each new episode the day it comes out. Thank you again for listening.